after release are all going to vary widely between programs and going to widely depend on what kind of goals we're trying to hit. So in post-release monitoring, there's already quite a bit of resources out there. Not as much, uh, surprisingly, as you would think, but three good resources that have some nice chapters on it are these three books. I pointed these out in my first opening talk for this series of talk, this uh, translocation symposium. Um, but I'd like to emphasize the center book, uh, which I think has the best chapter on this topic, uh, Reintroductions of Fish and Wildlife Populations. There's a really good um, essay in there by Robert Gitson and other co-authors. It's titled Effective and Purposeful Monitoring of Species Reintroductions, and I highly recommend trying to get a hold of that. And that really lays out all of the different kind of categories of data that you can collect and then the purpose of them and then provides good citations. So that kind of dips into these uh, each data category much deeper than I have time to go into here. Um, and there are, as mentioned, there's so many different types of data that you can collect in these monitoring programs, but uh, they fall kind of in three general categories. The first would be like an individual level. We're looking at data that's correlated to the individual animal. So is an animal surviving or not? Um, and spatial ecology of individuals. This would be for like, say, a tracking study that we're doing some radio telemetry on them, trying to figure out, you know, does animal A move more or does it stay at the release site? Um, and you might just have general ecology of some individuals, you know, what, what are they eating, whatnot. At the population level, this is typically the stuff that um, we look for when we're kind of trying to achieve some of our big goals like population size or demographics or having persistence at a site of a released population. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, you have all these kind of other sub questions and, and data types that can either fold into either population or individual level. For example, disease dynamics, you know, what percentage of the population might be infected with, uh, say, chytrid, chytridiomycosis, for example. Um, but that could be also on the individual level, too. We might be considering, you know, how long is one individual looking or in the field before it gets infected. So you can kind of push these back and forth. Uh, predator density or food availability is another type of monitoring that we can look at. So we can be kind of looking at things in that habitat that don't necessarily involve uh, viewing the individual animals. Um, habitat availability such as burrows and breeding sites is also super important as we're starting to see in a lot of reintroductions where, um, for example, like a refugia of uh, mammal burrows might be a critical resource that if you're releasing to an area that doesn't have, you know, a good mammal population that's creating these burrows, you might have a lot lower success rates. So it's very important to be kind of monitoring these kind of subtopics uh, besides just say like population size or trends. And I think there's really four key points to effective monitoring in a translocation. And the first is that this data has to advise the adaptive management plan. And whether that data makes you change or does not, uh, that's fine. Um, but we want to make sure that we're making discrete decisions, even to not change anything. That's okay, but we want to have that as a decision and not just kind of we're not really paying attention and things just stay the same. Secondly, monitoring uh, translocated amphibians is very similar to monitoring any amphibian population. If you've done a lot of field biology or field ecology in amphibians, um, you already know how to survey and look for amphibians and kind of um, keep track of them. So it's not any necessarily unique methods of a translocated population versus just an endangered population that you're trying to look for trends. You just might have different goals and timing of when you're gonna be doing those same methods. And we want all of our monitoring and our, our survey methods to be kind of comparable between time points. So for example, if we're doing yearly population counts, I want to be able to compare, you know, year one population counts, if we're say gonna release uh, 500 individuals every year, year after year after year, to see how this wild population is doing. Uh, I wanna be able to have it hopefully comparable with 10, 20, maybe 30 years down the road. Um, and I think it's important to uh, then think about these uh, methods we're using. And specifically that leads to our last point is using kind of standardized data collection methods. And one of the main reasons to do this is for example, um, if we're kind of doing kind of a half-assed kind of survey, 
uh, year one through five. And on year five of our translocation project, we start realizing, you know, we really need to have a really robust standard method section set. And then I have to, you know, redo all of my monitoring. And that's not ideal because then those first five years aren't necessarily comparable with all the years after that. And for part two of this talk, I just wanted to go over some of these kind of monitoring methods and um, briefly go over a few of them. And they really break down into first with these questions is um, methods that don't involve marked individuals. So this might be like point counts or going out and surveying. Um, and then um, the secondly is having individually marked, marked or batch marked individuals. And individually marked would be, say, uh, pit tags, which are pretty common at zoos where you're implanting, you know, something that then we can individually identify each animal to itself. Where batch marked would be, say, we uh, mark the whole release uh, in the same way, and then we know that that would be, you know, 2019's release. And so they're all marked, but it's kind of as a batch, and we're not necessarily worried about um, each individual animal. And there's lots of great methods that are already out there for monitoring of amphibians. Um, I wanted to highlight these three. The first one is the green book on the left. That's kind of the Bible of amphibian monitoring. Um, also, I'm, uh, I'm definitely partial to it because Mo will always yell at me if I ever, if I ever try to use something else. Um, but John Wilkinson recently published a, a newer, um, kind of slightly more updated uh, conservation handbook of surveying and monitoring. And then finally, there's a new uh, reptile standard methods for inventory and monitoring book. While it's not amphibian related, it still has really a lot of great um, kind of uh, survey methods and, and laying out the kind of groundwork on how to make stuff really replicable and, and that is also a really good resource to have. And what's also nice about using these standard methods is your methods can then be compared not only within your own program but also say between programs or between sites. We have a lot of pro you know a lot of these amphibians that might be say over multiple states in, and there's translocation programs happening in multiple places and different uh, different sites might have different jurisdiction or places. And if you can kind of all use the same method, then you're again, being standard. Uh, the first method that I think is by far the most common is just doing these visual encounter surveys where we go out and we look for amphibians and try to see, you know, after we release them, are they still out in the wild? Um, what happened to them? And these can be um, as robust or kind of um, basic as, as you want. But there's a few points that I wanted to point out that I think we see problems with is, is not quantifying for search effort and some of the basic principles of doing these visual encountered surveys to make them standardized. And the first is, you know, you're always going to be recording the amount of time searching and what time, you know, whether I go out in a day or a night, you know, I'm going to get different numbers back on how many animals I find to kind of monitor that population. And then secondly, the number of people, and it makes a big difference, right? So you have this person hours, which is super important, um, especially going between years, right? And you can get kind of falsified population diet data at a site if you're not taking this into account. Because, you know, two people, it's going to take probably twice as long to find the same number of animals as four people. And speed matters, too. So if you're walking through a place or if you're going through super, super fast, you might not find the same amount of animals. So you can kind of go down this rabbit hole of how standardized you want these surveys to be. Um, and skill matters too, whether I've got, you know, some vlogger who's sitting on his phone all day or, I don't know, my blind grandma goes out and doesn't know the difference between a lizard and a frog, that would give a big difference within uh, my results of this study. And again, you can go down just kind of endlessly standardizing these and you can really standardize them, but is it worth the effort on a lot of our methods? Um, for example, you could go out and you can hide frogs in the, in the weeds and there's methods to do this or little plastic ones and you send people out in five minutes, see how many they can find and you can standardize, you know, skill and whatnot. Uh, but a lot of times that might be really overboard. You just don't have the time and you just want to go out and kind of figure it out. And this is true too because visual encounter surveys are a great opportunity of outreach and that's one of the reasons too that these are very common is they're pretty low expense. Uh, this is just a picture I found on the internet from a recent amphibian survey that 
Um, I think it's just a great example. You get 20 people out there, you go up for four hours, you know, you get a few hundred person hours with, you know, no, probably the, the cost of that coffee there on the right of that photo and some cookies, you can get a big team out there. And this is also a great way to kind of engage local people and get them interested in amphibians and why you're out there doing this work and help them care about uh, the kind of work that we do. And there's all these other monitoring methods that then can be built into our uh, translocation monitoring programs. Um, tracking we've seen in other talks throughout the um, symposium here. And these can be both radio and harmonic. Radio, right, has the battery. It's typically what we have for radio telemetry, but also harmonic telemetry has been used for quite a few amphibians. And this uses a passive diode, so there's no battery. And uh, it's a picture there on the right. I've had good luck with this. It's just a different method. It's a little cheaper, but uh, you don't get the range. And this can really um, kind of give us this detailed behavioral and spatial movement data of our animals, you know and also survival. Sometimes it's really hard to get robust survival metrics of animals once they're released, but if we can use radio telemetry, we can get a greater recapture of these animals and see how well they're doing. Trapping is also pretty common. Um, and this is typically done with like drift fences. These are really fun. You bury a wall and you have these little pit traps in the openings of them. Um, it's a great method. You can find a lot of stuff, especially cryptic animals that might be in the leaf litter and you're not going to pick up doing visual encounter surveys, right? Because some animals, you just can't do visual encounter surveys. We wish we could, but it's uh, not feasible. Um, and drift fences are great, but they are a ton of work. Um, and how you do these is the same you would do for any kind of uh, amphibian population survey. Um, artificial refugia can be excellent as well for cover boards or PVC pipes. These have been well used in some reintroduction programs. Acoustic monitoring. Uh, I have uh, a lot of interest in this. I think the technology to do this is just getting better and better because um, some lab groups are starting to use machine learning and whatnot. So what this is, is you're recording the whole soundscape, right, of ever all the noise happening in an environment and then using a computer program, you can pull out individual frog calls of your, your main species and uh, using the amount of calls and the loudness of them, you can kind of get a, a metric of, of how many animals are out there, how well they're doing and their persistence. And this can be great for some animals that you just, you might never pick them up in a visual encounter survey, but there might be maybe five, you know, cryptic toads out in an environment and they might only call three nights a year, but you don't know, and you have to throw these things up, and then you can maybe get a much better detection with it. Environmental DNA is also a topic that, or a technique that's been out there for just a few years now. Um, I'm kind of dubious on how well it works. It's pretty situational, but for some stream uh, salamanders and things, this could be useful, and it has been done. Also, genetic monitoring is an important component of a lot of these programs. Um, depending on what your goals are, especially for like reinforcements, um, you can be, if you know what genetics you're putting out there into the population, you can kind of be monitoring it. Um, and you can also look at, um, for example, uh, migration between different populations and, and using genetics to kind of monitor, say, inbreeding and whatnot. And that whole slew of genetic techniques can be applied to these in these monitoring programs. Uh, when we mark individuals, there's just a huge variety of methods, and you'll find a lot of these written up in detail within some of those standard method books. Um, photo ID, toe clipping is still uh, used. It can be good um, if you're not toe clipping too many animals, but I think that method is kind of falling away because it's a little bit invasive. And visual and plant elastomer tags are these little plasticky kind of tattoos, or they might fluoresce that you can inject into the skin of the amphibian. and, and um, I've had good luck using those, even tagging some really, really small toadlets before. Pit tags as well, that's the little uh, like kind of RFID tag that goes under the skin, a tiny little pill that's implanted in the animal, and that'll give you individual IDs once you scan it. And typically with monitoring, what you're going to be using is a, is a combination of methods, right? One method is not going to give you kind of everything that you want. And it's gonna depend, again, on the natural history and the behavior and the ecology of each of these animals. So, for example, you might have four different kind of survey methods um, that you're gonna be using in your program. You might do a visual encounter 
surveys throughout the season. And you might combine that with tracking a small subset of individuals in the summer, especially I think this is important in initially in reintroductions because then you can get a better idea of their spatial ecology and uh, if they're staying on the, at the release site or not. And maybe you want to do a drift fence the year after um, to track spring migration. And the drift fence is great, something like that, because then you might be able to be marking lots of individuals and you can get kind of these population demographics as well. Uh, and then finally, just swab every single animal you pick up for BD. So you start getting this kind of portfolio of different data that you're collecting. Um, and then you can start looking at population trends, uh, individual survival through those drift fences if you're marking them and tracking them. And then you start to get a much better idea of what these animals are doing after release. So figuring out what your optimum balance uh, for cost, benefit, and time, and your capability of these different survey methods and kind of making a suite that fits best for your program. And the release type uh, for our reintroductions or translocations also then influences this monitoring plan. And again, there's two general ways to release animals. The first is a ha hard release, right? You just toss them out there. You bring them out to the release site, you let them go, and then you kind of monitor them afterward. Increasingly, we're seeing evidence that sometimes soft releases can be uh, very useful or at least um, improve survival and this could be acclimating these animals to the release site. Uh, this is a soft release enclosure I've used with Wyoming toads that uh, I think helped some of their spatial ecology and probably reduce predation a little bit. Um, you could have predator management, uh, food supplementation, or disease management. These are all soft release. That just means that you're kind of helping this population along a little bit uh, after they're out into the wild. And I think, especially with disease management, we're going to be seeing more and more of this uh, in wild populations. So another point that I always like to emphasize, and I get this question a lot, is their value in doing small translocations. Um, I would say absolutely. There's kind of a, a false idea that if you're going to be doing a translocation, you need to have you know, this huge, robust sample of I don't know, 500 individuals of a huge variety of genetics, and it's going to be this, you know, one and done, uh, standing forever persistent population um, after you do it. But I think that is difficult to do. And as we've seen in most programs, it's this, you know, kind of yearly slow build uh, to get up to maybe that point. And small releases can really provide a lot of data, it's lower cost, and it's a good way to test techniques, train staff, and avoid these mistakes. Um, and if you're gonna do the first you know, translocation, I think these are just so critical. And you might have, well, you always have tons of problems that you didn't anticipate. Um, you might just need to learn how to transport your animals. You know, you might be driving out a really rough site and you hit too many bumps and these things got jostled and your tadpoles all got, you know, internal injuries. Or maybe I didn't acclimate them right to the water quality and I didn't uh, keep the pH change, you know, slow enough and then they all died. So you might want to try it with just a few animals first just to do kind of a dry run. And also with, you know, doing small translocations, um, I think it's a good way to kind of keep staff excited and keep get people in the field. And it really kind of prevents a sense of uh, conservation paralysis, I think, that we have seen in the past in some amphibian kind of reintroduction programs where we're so scared of maybe chytrid or whatnot. But there's this huge, um, a, a whole bunch of different uh, methods that we first need to figure out with any reintroduction before, you know, if you have big problems like chytrid that you need to figure out. Uh, for example, if you were going to do soft release and releases and you want to put some animals in an outdoor enclosure, what is that outdoor enclosure made of? What kind of screen do you have on it? Is it, uh, what size is it? Um, how big is it going to be? Is it going to stand up? Are you going to have monkeys tear it apart? I mean, I had cows tear all of mine apart my first time and I realized, oh man, you know, I need to like put barbed wire fence around all this stuff. Um, you just have to kind of keep, um, building these 
uh, programs and trying to avoid a lot of these mistakes that you're totally going to run into. So these small translocations, especially initially, can really help build a nice foundation. And if you have these smaller ones, you can really design them as small experiments and start fleshing out how to uh, best achieve uh, translocation where you're actually going to get animals to persist in the wild long term. And just to go over a couple kind of case studies um, that basically hypothetical, but these are kind of based off ones that have happened. So if you have this first one, if we're going to reintroduce, say, 100 adult salamanders to a forested area, say some dicamptodons, you know, you might have a monitoring plan where you're just, you know, 10 days after post-release, you're going to go out and you're going to look for them. And then once we see them, we're going to record substrate at every location. You know, what's this animal doing? What's it on? Is it in the water? Is it in the ground? What not? But you could have a better uh, monitoring plan. So I'm a big proponent of front-loading uh, monitoring immediately after release. So instead of just waiting 10 days, is go out and look for these animals, you know, day one, two, three, four, five, and then every 10 days. Because I think a lot of the problems that you might see might happen in that first 10 days. And without going out there to look for them, you might not notice it. Uh, you might just have animals just eat them all day long, the first five days, and by then, day 10, there's none there. Or you screwed something up on your transportation, they got heat shocked and they all died. I don't know, six hours after y'all put them out there, but, you know, 10 days later, um, I don't know, little scavengers and stuff have eaten all the bodies of your animals, and you have no idea that your animals even died. You might have just thought they disappeared. So front-loading your monitoring, I think, is, is really helpful. Um, and then maybe you take this program and you don't have a lot of money, so you just put some cover boards out there, too. You get some habitat enrichment just to see if they use them. Um, start getting a better idea and then batch mark all these individuals so that next year you know which these are. Um, and then I'm a big fan of kind of building in smaller sub hypotheses um, to kind of look at other questions. For example, if we don't know the diet about these animals, let's do a gastric lavage where we look at the stomach contents of just 10 individuals out of that 130 days post release. So it's kind of a one and done thing, but you might, you know, figure out a little bit more about the natural history and ecology of these animals. And uh, I think that's kind of important to keep kind of thinking about. And, you know, you might have one day where you go out and you try to get stomach contents and you throw a master's student on there and try to, you know, identify what that animal's eating. And you can kind of go more data rich as far as your program. So you're kind of hitting these different metrics. Uh, it's another brief just case study. So if you uh, reintroduce 30 adult newts, you have very, very few. This would be a nice example of a, a very small uh, reintroduction. And this is actually based off a real case study from uh, northern Iran recently. And if you go out and survey weekly or batch mark them, release them all together, a better way to maybe do it is split them into two release treatments. And this is what um, some authors recently did. Um, where they soft release 15 animals and hardly release 15 animals, and you compare survival. So immediately, even with just 30 animals, you can start testing things like caging design, survival, whether it's better to do a soft release, uh, and then individually marking them. If you're, if you're going to have just 30 animals, try to mark them all. And then once you're out there, you'll know if you're finding the same animals or which ones, uh, just getting more of a data-rich environment. So some general tips, just try to make that data as really comparable as possible. And then go to data rich. Um, and I say that over and over, but I think it's, it's there's so many lost opportunities when we go out and we, we just count animals and you're like one, two, three. But where was that animal? You know, was it on a tree? If it was on a tree, what height was it at? What perch height? Um, was it under a board? Was it under a log? You know, is it in leaf litter? You can start teasing out, especially natural history questions out of a lot of these um, survey and that can really help with our habitat assessments and things down the road and then front load that monitoring so that immediately after release you're you're really trying to relocate those animals as as much as possible just initially uh, and that's true especially even with like radio telemetry and whatnot because we can you can have a lot of animals bolt and whatnot immediately and uh, can help kind of keep a better eye on where all our animals are going and then finally, just to incorporate community outreach if possible, and then these small trials, which I just, I can't, you know, emphasize enough. Um, the picture on the right is one of Melanie Murphy and Julie Plastic's uh, wonderful study on caging of tadpoles for kind of raising them up in the field for Wyoming toads, and that was a big success. Um, and they use dozens of these enclosures as huge field team and whatnot. But you know, before you get to that point, first you might just have to use you know one of those enclosures and test it out. 
you know, even for a month and see how it works before you run into pitfalls of trying to do too big too fast. And with that, I'll kind of wrap up my little introduction here on post-release monitoring.